There's an idiom that goes back to ancient Japan that goes something like this. What I thought was a ghost was merely dried grass. It's a way of saying things aren't as they appear, or fear is playing tricks on your mind. Ghosts are a commonly referenced aspect of Japanese folklore, a variety of figures undone either by their failures as people or simply unfortunate circumstances. Whether they're real or just dried grass, the legend endures all the same. I think this is the case for Ghost of Tsushima, and while it's clearly a lot more of a video game than an ancient folktale, it's nonetheless the legend of a samurai who becomes a ghost to protect his home. Spoopy yokai channel opening aside, this game was a real treat in a year that struggled to be enjoyable, and I'd like to take some time to lay out what it did to earn a place in my heart. For me, it's a game that harmonizes its gameplay and narrative in order to convey, develop, and ultimately resolve the inner struggle of its main character, Jin Sakai, the man who ultimately sacrifices everything he has for the sake of defending his home. We'll be mildly spoilery, but I won't be going over every plot point in detail. I'll start by softening the central caveat of the setting. It's very broadly based on the Mongolian invasions of outer Japanese island territories in the late 13th century. These invasions were ultimately repelled by a combination of sustained resistance and freak storms, which is where the game's interest in accurately depicting history ends. That our protagonist just so happens to have lightning bolt and storm cloud motifs on his sword is pure coincidence, I assure you. Ghost is less of a history book and more of a love letter to Japanese iconography and samurai media. For some examples, katana-style sword designs and the requisite swordsmithing techniques to make them weren't actually developed until half a century after the events the game is built around, and samurai code in real life was a bit more... Uh, morally flexible. <laughs> Some of the armor Jean can wear is a blend of designs borrowed from famous figures the game is a couple centuries early for, like Shingen Takeda and Masamune Date. Despite not technically being accurate to the setting, these chiefly visual elements are here for the cool factor, and they're so flush with color and detail that it's hard not to find the enthusiasm they were clearly made with to be contagious. I'll spend some more time on the visuals a bit later, but I want you to get to know the centerpiece of the story a little better. On the eve of the Mongol landing, 80 samurai, sworn to defend the island of Tsushima with their lives, prepare to meet the Mongol invasion head-on at Komoda Beach. Jin Sakai, our protagonist, and his uncle, Lord Shimura, are among the defenders. The samurai charge headlong into a meat grinder, and it isn't long before they're overwhelmed and slaughtered to the last man. The Mongol leader, Kotun Khan, captures a humiliated Lord Shimura, and the last man, Jin, is left for dead. All in all, pretty bad day. Jin isn't finished yet, though. He's nursed back to fighting strength by a scavenger, a woman called Yuna. Together, they recover Jin's sword, take horses, and escape a town falling under the Mongol occupation. Jin expresses strong distaste for the underhanded guerrilla tactics Yuna suggests during the escape. We can get close, slit their throats, and kill them without a sound. Without honor. As they go against the principles Lord Shimura raised him on, and insists on charging into the fortress his uncle is being held in, this attempt goes... Poorly. And this time, the Khan himself proves that the only way of life Jin's ever known isn't going to save his home. At the bottom of the ravine, the broken samurai rises once more, and follows the wind to find a new path forward. The first act in the story of Jin's transformation into a new kind of warrior begins with the painful admission that he might have to make some exceptions to the code of honor his uncle taught him. The Khan expects to fight a war against the samurai. He will anticipate our every move unless we find new ways to surprise him. Most of this part of the story is spent getting Jin begrudgingly comfortable with more pragmatic tactics, as well as rounding up combat talent who, for various reasons, didn't fight at Komoda Beach, and thus still have their insides inside. These characters are important since some have longer side stories that help mirror an aspect of Jin's personal struggle throughout the game. Jin starts an insurgency that grows from the southern tip of the island, and he employs guerrilla tactics like assassination and ambushes against the Mongol occupation forces. His uncle might view these methods as dishonorable. Only cowards strike from the shadows. 
But Jin's actions are in the name of preserving the lives of as many Tsushima Islanders as possible. When these tactics succeed in the rescue of Yuna's blacksmith brother Taka and some peasants from a Mongol work camp, Yuna starts cultivating an urban legend among the common folk. He is a vengeful spirit, back from the grave to slaughter the Mongols. Gradually, the people of Tsushima spread whispers of a deadly and powerful ghost that has come to avenge the fallen samurai and sow fear among the invaders. This tall tale is a rallying point for a growing insurgency, but untrained farmers need some professional help to survive on a battlefield. Ryuzo is an estranged childhood friend of Jin's, who fell into mercenary work and eventually became the leader of the Straw Hats, rogue samurai chiefly concerned with their next meal. Sensei Ishikawa is a master archer who missed the beach landing on account of chasing his student, who's gone a little rogue, due in no small part to his sunny disposition. Do not judge me. Do not lie to me. Lady Masako Adachi is a vengeful grandmother hunting those responsible for the betrayal and massacre of her family. With an A-team of sorts, Jin mounts Raid 2 on the castle. This attempt is a success, though the victory is diminished since Ryuzo and the Straw Hats defect to the Mongols to during the rescue, and the Khan had already fled north. While Shimura is glad to be reunited with his nephew, he is very concerned that the rumors the Khan was taunting him with about Jin's dishonorable actions were confirmed by the tactics used in the rescue. To Shimura's eyes, Yuna looks like the perfect scapegoat to protect Jin's reputation from the Shogun's scrutiny. The ideological conflict that underlies much of the rest of the game begins in earnest as it becomes clear that Jin may have to choose between preserving his only family tie and the fate of Tsushima. Act 2 is a series of events that escalates the violence Jin uses against the invaders dramatically, like breaking the bloody siege at Yarikawa in an even bloodier fashion, or Jin's initial uses of terror tools such as poison. His legend grows rapidly across the island with every victory. After suffering a significant tragedy towards the end of the second act, Jin has no patience left for his uncle's tradition and rigidity when the lives of his people are at stake. So he goes to terrifying lengths to es My lungs are going to terrifying lengths. Terrifying lengths to exterminate a Mongol stronghold all on his own. By the third act, Jin has nothing left to lose, branded a criminal for defying the will of the Shogun. He's still got an island to save, so Jin embraces his legend as the ghost, the spirit of Tsushima's revenge. His actions help to coordinate the defeat of the invaders with the help of a great storm, and the island is set free. In the epilogue, we're left with the question of what consequences Jin's actions will have for both himself and the rest of Japan, and whether or not he can mend his relationship with his uncle. Now for the real capital C content. To continue, we'll discuss Yuna and a bit of Taka. At the beginning of the game, there's a profound gap between Yuna's mentality and Jin's. He's dismayed to realize that his rescuer is, apparently, a common thief looking for a favor. However, the honorable boy that he is, Jin always pays his debts, and Brother Rescue is a generally noble and sympathetic goal in his book. Jin suffers some dissonance as he gets to know Yuna better, as he leaves the bubble of samurai lifestyle and Shimura's influence. Regardless of their differences, when it comes to surviving the Mongols, they have almost everything in common. Despite Yuna's survivalist rhetoric, she consistently demonstrates a sense of personal loyalty that doesn't fit Jin's perception of her social class. I'm coming with you! Stay close! Or Yuna's perception of herself, for that matter. Her love for Taka and conviction to preserve what family she has left quickly overrides Jin's preconceived notions, and over time they become sufficiently familiar that Yuna lapses into her habits as a doting older sister for Jin as well as Taka. You should get some rest. No, dear. That's... Sit. Just a little longer. One of the better scenes that shows this developing bond takes place the night before the Battle of Yarakawa. I think you need this more than me. Jin and Yuna share several drinks that get both of them talking about their upbringings. This is terrible. <laughs> My mother loved it. <laughs> Take in liquid, expel words. In Yuna's case, she recounts her struggle to escape her alcoholic mother and the challenge of caring for her brother in a world that sought only to take advantage of two unlucky kids that needed help. She's not proud of the things she had to do to get herself and Taka out of many bad situations alive, and by this point, Jin knows that feeling all too well. She's forced to face this grim past head on upon learning that the Japanese slave traders who had once taken her and Taka captive are back in business with the Mongolian Empire as their newest clientele. Jin and Yuna are assisted in tracking these slavers down by a woman Yuna seems to have a history with, 
As the trail gets warmer, we learn that this woman tried to escape the same slave camp as Yuna and Taka had, but Yuna didn't realize she was recaptured while they went free. This perceived betrayal has gnawed at Yuna ever since, and it's why she doesn't begrudge the woman for her cold demeanor. This resonates strongly with Jin, his fractured relationship with Ryuzo has a similar tragedy to it, in that he's also someone Jin left behind as he moved forward in life. This time, however, Yuna faces her demons with a ghost at her side. Jin takes the heads of the slavers under cover of darkness, and they're displayed on pikes as a grotesque reminder of the price of selling one's fellow man. Yuna remains a steadfast companion to Jin to the end, and an important reminder to him that a so-called common thief can be as noble as any samurai. Compared to his sister, Taka is as much of a ray of sunshine as his outfit suggests. I've never seen a samurai fight like that. Was nothing. The plucky blacksmith's innocence has been preserved to some degree by his sister's willingness to give up her own, and it's hard to dislike the guy. He just wants to help, and his handy tools open up a whole new dimension of tactical approaches. The grappling hook is instrumental in rescuing Lord Shimura, but Taka wants to be more than just the guy who builds gadgets for Samurai Batman. If I stayed in Yarekawa, I'd be useless. Better useless than dead. Despite his sister's protest, Taka becomes the ghost's number one fan and starts dipping his toes into battle. He's inexperienced and over-eager, but Taka's participation emboldens him and fosters his independence. Taka is a bit like an avatar for the common people of Tsushima, and his enthusiasm is a barometer for the popularity of the ghost. He's a legend. Mm, see? Your people will follow you. He's the most hopeful character in the game, and when he stands tall in the face of impossible odds, he's a paragon of courage that inspires Jin to keep going in his darkest hour. If Taka and Yuna are representatives of the common people, then Lord Shimura is a representative of the aristocratic samurai class and the authority of the Shogun. Until Shimura's rescue, we see him in much the same way Jin has up until that point, as a dignified and caring man who lives by a noble code. In flashbacks, he's a patient teacher who effectively explains the intended value of every principle he teaches Jin. Attack! I am ready! Huh? The reason this is so important to executing his story well, in my opinion, is that the sentiment behind his actions both feels authentic and is believably established early in the game. Enough! <laughs> I yield! You let me win. Not at all. If you held a real sword, I would be dead. Really? I would never lie to you, Jin. Then, the story flips the coin and shows the other side of both Samurai Code and Shimura himself. I sent them to die. For nothing. The first chink in the armor is fairly obvious from the opening. The Khan understood the strategic weakness and the rigidity of samurai honor, and exploited it to the hilt. It's an uncomfortable fact Shimura stubbornly rejects during his time as a political prisoner and even after his jailbreak. It's in Act 2 that Jin starts to see hypocrisy in his uncle, something he didn't have the perspective to notice before. It's hard for him to accept through their shared sentiment for one another, as Shimura is 100% ready to request that the Shogun formalize the relationship as father and son by allowing Shimura to adopt Jin as his son and heir. In my heart, you have always been the heir to my legacy. Historically, this kind of action was what we call a really big deal, as adoptions had a similar political significance to strategic marriages. In Jin's case, it would make him the heir to not just one, but two of Tsushima's ruling clans, and officially make Shimura into what Jin sees him as, the loving father he thought he'd lost his chance to have. To say it's painful for Jin and Shimura to reject one another is an understatement. You sent our men to die. They are soldiers. Their blood is on our hands. The evidence of his uncle's flaws pile up before Jin's eyes as the game wears on, and it hurts him. I sacrificed everything I knew to save our people. I gave them hope. You did nothing. The noble samurai wants to set a positive example for the commoners, but he is also only interested in the courageous acts of other samurai. Yuna saved Jin on the beach, but to Shimura, she's just another thief. I know. I grew up there. Is that where you learn to steal? Samurai are meant to control their emotions and act judiciously. Yet, Shimura can't handle being criticized for his fatal flaw, his myopic value of honor above the intrinsic value of life, something his nephew understands and has started to grow beyond. By Act 3, Jin and Shimura's relationship is nearly beyond repair. Shimura ultimately lives a lie, showing he's more than willing to use deception to placate the Shogun with someone to punish for the crimes of the ghost. I know. She drove you to this. Uncle, renounce the ghost. 
It's a selfish act made out of fatherly love that makes Shimura a man who should be criticized for his actions, but he's also challenging to condemn for the intent behind them, and the finale of the game capitalizes on the player's feelings about Shimura in a very impactful way. <laughs> It's hard to talk about all these betrayals and broken relationships, but it's also pretty hard to segue. I'm gonna say comparatively little about Ryuzo, because most of the context in which he appears is very spoilerific, but his story serves as a darker mirror to Jin's. Their fates as friends diverged long before the story began. After a competition that Jin won against Ryuzo, Jin's uncle cloistered him deeper into privileged samurai life, and Jin's success cost Ryuzo any chance he may have had to achieve something similar. When they re unite his men, Ryuzo is jaded and embittered, but like his old friend, still values something larger than himself. In his case, Ryuzo places paramount importance on the well-being of the mercenaries in the Straw Hats, and his responsibility to maintain it as their commander. This virtue proves to be a critical weakness as the Ronin grow more desperate for food across a series of failed raids, a vulnerability shrewdly capitalized on by the Khan. He's your family, Jin. I need to protect mine. Divide and conquer was the MO of inspired Mongolian commanders, and it works like a charm as these straw hats proved to be a very difficult enemy throughout the game. Ryuzo, much like Jin, takes steps down a dark path to sustain his men, but his choice leaves him at the Khan's mercy, and to say that he is a demanding taskmaster is putting it lightly. <laughs> Open the gate! Open the gate! By the time the two former friends meet once again late in the game, they can hardly recognize each other, and they both learn that the cost of war can always get higher. You won't stop me, Vizo. So, now that I've thoroughly depressed you, uh, bad news, end of the video, good news, part two.